like I said, I'm not jealous. This isn't design. Um, so I'll be wearing multiple hats today. But regardless, welcome to news. Um, I do see a couple of new faces. So welcome. I see some new faces too. Uh, so good to see everybody here today. Uh, we um, Can someone turn on the TV for me, by the way? Um, we are wrapping up basically in the book of Exodus. So we're not going to do the entirety of the book of Exodus, um, but we are just going to do uh, up until toward the, the Ten Commandments. Um, but with that, uh, after this, we will most likely go to the book of Galatians, but we shall see. Um, but yes, we're near the end. So we are actually at the Ten Commandments right now, and we're going to do the first few, and then we'll do the, the latter half next week. So with that, the question I want to ask today is, what defines today's moral compass? It's kind of a I don't know, um, weird question to ask. Um, but, you know, I, I'm just curious because I realize that I come from a very different era, and I'll talk about that in a second. But literally, I'm, I'm curious, what defines today what dictates what is right and wrong to people? I'm very curious. Yes, Kai. The latest blog article they read. The latest blog article, okay, so she, she doesn't say news or credible source, she says blogs, right? So blogs have power. Um, I heard there's the internet. Um, so a lot of people go to the internet, people talk about fake news and stuff like that. Um, what else? Hmm? Political agendas, right? So you'll see uh, very biased uh, things that come out from time to time. Um, anything else? Hmm? Feelings. Feelings, so emotion, right? What feels right, what feels wrong. Uh, so a lot of people go by what, what they think is right or wrong. It's okay, guys, don't worry about the TV. Uh, <laughs> I don't want you guys to take it apart. Um, <laughs> thank you, though, thank you. Um, I'll just be looking at the screen today. But regardless, so you guys didn't know, I'm reading from the TV most of the time. You guys are like, wow, he has it memorized. No, no, I'm reading from the TV. But anyway, so you'll see me do this today. Um, anyway. So, um, I realized that I come from a very different era, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. So this is my era. Um, my era was when the Ten Commandments were still actually allowed to be displayed at, at public like, you know, schools. This is something that happened in the past few decades where this is now not allowed. Um, I went to a private Baptist school. This is actually my school down here, Arlington Baptist School down there. Um, I had to wear a white Oxford shirt and a, a, a dark green khaki. Um, that was my uniform throughout my childhood, and up until sixth grade. And uh, anybody know what this flag is right here? This is not Texas. What are you talking about? This is not Texas. The Christian flag. Of course, Justin knows this because he's school it tomorrow. Um, but the Christian flag you will see at Christian schools. And so when we pledge allegiance, we pledge allegiance to the American flag and the Christian flag. I actually don't remember the pledge to the Christian flag anymore. Do you know it, Justin? I forgot. Yeah, that's right. Um, um, but, you know, I came from an era also where evolution, when I was in elementary school, wasn't being taught. It was around middle school was when it started to come into the public schools. I even remember my seventh grade teacher reading from what she told us was an illegal book, and it was actually a book on evolution. Um, by the time I was in high school, that was completely different. And so by the time I was in high school, it was, it was basically what everyone was teaching and what everyone was, was embracing as truth. But I kind of come from a transition era where I was, you know, I went to a Baptist private school. And so for, for us, like, you know, we were taught the Bible, we were taught, um, you know, a lot of things about what, what good morals are. But out of my own curiosity, I'm like, I know, I realize that I'm not normal. <laughs> um, a lot of people don't really come from this background anymore, so I'm very curious, like, what dictates today what is right and wrong? Um, I can tell you, like, I was raised, like, very black and white, this is right and wrong, um, for, for, for better or worse. But, but I know that that's not today anymore, right? Anyway, let's go ahead and get into the text. So, Exodus 20, starting from verse 1, open your phone, or Bibles, smartphones, look at the screen, I'll be looking at the screen today too. Exodus 20, starting from verse 1, where the Lord says this, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other God before me. Um, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in the heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. 
For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and the seas and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites this, you have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to, to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves golds, uh, uh, gods of silver and, and gods of gold. Uh, make an altar of earth for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. Wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stones for, uh, for me, do not build it with dress stones, for you will defile it if you use a tool on it. And do not go up to my altar on steps or your private parts may be exposed. That's not a really good way to end. Um, but yeah, so 2017, our theme for the year, just to remind you guys, is the gospel of freedom, understanding that the good news of Jesus Christ brings us more freedom and freedom. Um, I'm going to adjust something really quick that I think might help with this. But uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay. Hopefully that helps. Um, so... A reminder that this is what we hope to experience is freedom from some source of oppression or burden in our lives this year. Now, we've been going through the book of Exodus. We're nearing our end for where we will stop. Um, but just a reminder that, that this has all been about God's faithfulness to the, the Israelite people and how he has, uh, you know, he remembered his promise from 400 years ago and he sent a man who, though flawed, God would use. This man Moses, he raised up, built him up, empowered him, and, and, and showed his mighty acts through these ten plagues, and through them ultimately freed Israel, and brought them into, and brought them in, you know, into this wilderness where they would worship him, and that's where we ended um, last week, was they were at Mount Sinai, and God was, was telling Israel, I have freed you, but I desire more for you. I want you to be my prized possession. I want you to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood. This is my desire for you. And so for that to happen, this is what you must do. And that's kind of where we're being left off right here. So right when we get into this, what we just read from Exodus 20, this is actually God speaking, right? Let me make this clear. This is not just, you know, Moses dictating what God is saying. The, what, what chapter 19 was telling us was that the voice of God was speaking and, and responding to Moses. So basically, if you remember that picture that we had of Mount Sinai, you have all the Israelites um, below it, and they were kept away from it because the mountain was literally on fire, trembling and shaking. There was lightning and thunder. There was this loud trumpet blast. It was scary. And then all of a sudden, the voice of God comes out and starts proclaiming these things. So these Ten Commandments that we call them, this is actually what God directly said to His people. This is not the entirety of the law that's going to come later, but this is what God Himself spoke to His people. And so that's why this is known as the Decalogue. That's why I named this the Decalogue. Decalogue is, is Greek for ten words. It was obviously more than ten words. Um, but basically, th that, that implies that, that God spoke these things to His people. This is not just commandments. These are actually the very words of God directed to the Israelites. And so we know this is the Ten Commandments. And there's a little bit of controversy over which one is which number, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a second. But remember, God is speaking this. And if you look later in the passage, the passage that we'll get into next week, the people were so terrified, they're like, okay, Moses, we'll listen to you, but don't let God speak anymore because it's going to kill us. Like, it brought terror upon them. They couldn't handle hearing the voice of God. But even so, he spoke these words directly to his people. So, um, now just to remind you again, God has already freed them from Egypt. They're not going back. Right? God has made that once and for all, especially at the, at the Red Sea where he defeated <clears throat> Pharaoh once and for all. The Israelites are not going back. They are free. 
That will never change. But just to remind you, God wants them not to just be free people, but He wants them to be His people. He wants them to be His prized possession, His holy nation, His royal priesthood. And so He's bringing out terms for that to happen. And so basically, when God says, this is what I want you to do, this is how the people will respond. They respond here in chapter 19, as well as later on in chapter 24. And they basically say the same, same thing. We will do everything the Lord has said, or everything the Lord has said, we will do. It's basically reversed, right? They're saying the same thing. Basically, what they are doing is, they are entering a relationship with God. So now it's going from, from just being a people that God had promised to free, that now they are actually entering a covenant relationship, if you want to get technical. They're entering a covenant relationship with God. A more practical way to look at this is, gen like literally speaking, they are marrying God. This is more like a marriage relationship. God is marrying the nation of Israel. And what is changing is, if you remember what Moses said when he named his son Eliezer, is that my father's God is my helper. So the thing is, this generation of Israelites, they knew who God was, but they knew God as our father's God. You know, the God of hundreds of years ago. But what God is making now is, I want to be your God. Not your father's God. I want to be your God. You are entering into a relationship with me. You are becoming my people. You are becoming part of my promise. And so this is the start of a relationship. You know, if you want to get into today's terms, you could almost say that this is somewhat of a DTR. <laughs> They're in a relationship, so now they got to define the terms, right? So they got to be like, okay, this is, this is what it means for us to be in this relationship. This is what it means for you to be my people. Remember, I am holy. So how are you going to be my people when you're not that holy yet? And so this is the start of that relationship. And so God is teaching them and instructing them because He wants them to be something more, something greater. And so um, this, this first part where it says, I am the Lord your God, right? A lot of people like to call this the first commandment. Um, some people will say this is the first commandment and they will combine the, the first and second, the ones traditionally seen as the first and second together into the second. Um, others will say that this is just a preface. This is just, just um, you know, this is just the beginning part. It's kind of like an overall statement. Um, the main thing is I want you to get is, even though a lot of people don't talk about this verse, it's an important verse. Where normally people go right into, you know, you shall have no other God before me. It always starts off with, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. That's the starting point of this relationship. And if you remember back when we were doing chapter 6, God made this very statement, I, Yahweh, I am the Lord. And he did that when Moses was doubting him. When Moses was like, you know what, your people aren't listening to me, this isn't going to work, I can't do this. God repeated this, you know, this, this, this like seven times is, I am the Lord, I will take care of this, don't worry about it, I got this. And in the same way, he starts off this Ten Commandments by saying, I am the Lord. This is who I am. Remember, this is the starting point. Is I am the God who saved you. I saved you. This is, this is basically the, the, the beginning point of this relationship. Why is it even starting? I saved you. I rescued you from oppression. I rescued you from something that you could not get out of on your own. This is who I am. And so we start off with the first, the first traditional commandment. Most people look at this as the first traditional commandment where it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Right? Now this is a very general statement. It's like, okay, alright God, you're number one. <laughs> like, like it's, it's, it's a very broad statement. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to really understand, like, well, how do you, like, what do you mean by that? Like, how, how do we actually live in a way that, that we're putting you above all things? And so the second commandment actually makes it a little bit more clear, where it says, you know, don't worship anything made from man. Don't worship these idols. Don't worship these objects. God made it clear that he didn't want his people to bow down to idols. 
you, know, you could you could raise a question. Well, like you know, if man is made in the image of God, you know, couldn't they just make a figure that looks like a man? And technically, it's kind of like worshiping God. Um, yeah. Well, the, the thing is, here is the issue with with worshiping objects. Uh, once an object is identified as something that is connected to God or something that is good, all of a sudden. What that object is representing doesn't get worshipped, the object is worshipped. So like, let me, let me give you a more tempor contemporary example. So right now, especially in certain Christian circles, there's a lot of focus on, on uh, like, like spiritual power and signs and wonders, right? And so there's a lot of belief that like, you know, you have to manifest signs and wonders, like to see these things to worship God, and I'm not saying that God can't do that, but a lot of times the problem that I see in these circles is there's such a focus on the signs that they forget about what the signs are for. Right? You know, I know Pastor Leo likes to use the illustration, but it's like, you don't go to a stop sign and be like, wow, that's the greatest sign I've ever seen. And you're like bowing down to the stop sign. No, you don't. You, you, what matters is what that sign represents, what that sign means, what that sign points to. And the problem is, is when you create an object, all of a sudden that takes away from what should be worshipped. Now the other thing too is, God sent His most perfect representation in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came as a human being. Jesus came and walked on this earth as God incarnate. And that was the most perfect representation of God ever to exist. So God knew there was no need for anything else. Anything else would pale in comparison. Now, for us these days, it's a little bit different. Where uh, we're not from the era of like a lot of superstition and um, and spiritual questioning, where where an object is actually something that we would worship. That's not really today's era. But at the same time, brothers and sisters, idolatry is very much real today as it was in the past. Because ultimately, an idol is something that takes away your devotion from God and, and takes it for itself. And that could be many of different things. You know, uh, there's still a lot of focus on like the worship of wealth, right? Man, mammon, right? The the worship of wealth and, and, and riches, right? Or, or the 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 worship of, of fame. That's kind of I, I think more of Korea today is like everyone wants to be famous, right? So many shows about becoming famous. Um, like I know America kind of started off with American Idol, which is ironically called American Idol. Um, but like, like the amount of like these type of shows in Korea is like it's 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 getting crazy, right? Like I can't even keep track of it anymore. Um, there is a desire for many to become famous, right? Wealth has always been an issue. Fame, I think, is starting to to come very close to taking it over. But it could be many different things, right? This is a nation that, that focuses a lot on education, on, on reputation, on, on, on all these different things. And it's very easy for us, brothers and sisters, to lose sight of God. Because there's a lot of competition. And I think one of the things I really want you to get from today is God doesn't want to compete with anything else. He wants you holy. He wants you exclusively. But we're living in an age where there is so much competition, there is so much idolatry, we just don't even realize it. Because it's not a simple object that we're looking at anymore, it's more of a concept. Continuing on. Um, so, what he says is, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, let me remind you, we have entered into a relationship with God. This is what the Israelites have done, this is what we have done when we accept Jesus Christ as our saviors. We have entered in a relationship with God. God already says, I'm a jealous God. Now when we think of the word jealous, it tends to have more of a negative tone. Jealous is a very negative word, right? Um, it's not like something you would say as a compliment to someone. Like, man, you're really jealous. Thank you. <laughs> you, you would never say that, because this is a very negative word um, today. But really, the word jealous that's used for God is actually also defined as zealous, right? 
God has zeal. God has this earnest desire. I know people that play StarCraft with the oh, Zilla. Well, but anyway, um, so God has this fervor, this this desire to be the, in this intense relationship with you. And it may, and and really, one of the ways that we can see this is when Jesus goes to the temple of God. He sees that it's become a marketplace, and he goes crazy. He just tears up the whole place. And he says, "This is a den of thieves and robbers." Do not make this a place that's anything to draw. This is a house of prayer, right? That was Jesus showing his zeal and anger, his righteous anger toward God's house being the fame. That is zealous. That is how God looks upon you. He sees you with that same intensity. So he says, I am a jealous God. And he goes on and says, you know what? For those that, that disobey me and they hate me, it's going to go generationally. It's going to go to the third or fourth generation. But those who love me, I will bless them for a thousand generations. What that tells us is, yes, God has anger, but there is a limit. Right? It goes to the third and fourth generation. While his love, it's infinite. It goes to thousands of generations. Now, I've talked about this before. There is such a thing as generational sin. And honestly, I, I've witnessed it more and more that the, the way that I've observed is that the sins that we commit, ultimately, it doesn't end with us. It passes on to the generations after us. And so many times when you see people that are struggling with things, a lot of times it's not necessarily that a problem. It got passed on to them from their ancestors. It's kind of a scary thing. But on the other side, when we are faithful to God and we choose to obey and to love Him, He blesses not just us, but He blesses thousands of generations after us. Now, for me, brothers and sisters, I've kind of, like, again, I say I'm, a, I'm not a normal person. Uh, I'm a fourth-generation believer, and I have lived in that wealth of blessing from my previous generations. Like, it's not me. I'm like, why is my life so much easier than my, my ancestors? It's because they were faithful. So that kind of puts the onus on me, like, you know what, I need to step up my game, because if I don't, my ancestors are going to be angry at me. <laughs> but regardless, I live in more of, of the wealth of, of, of seeing the blessings of God throughout the generations. And so I want you to remember, God does have anger, but His love is so much greater than His anger. Now, God continues and says, do not use my name in vain, right? Now, we sang a song, you know, what a beautiful name. We sang all these different things. Names are very important, okay? Um, that's very biblical. And so the, the meaning of names is very important. And especially when you look in the Bible, when anyone changes their name, it kind of, it, it kind of represents a shift in their, like, their fate, like their life. Like all, if their name changes, all of a sudden, like everything changes for them. Names are very important. And for me personally, the reason why I believe so is I believe that there is power in the spoken word. And that when you someone has a name, when you are saying that name, you are proclaiming that word, that meaning upon them again and again. And so to me, I've always seen like, you know, like, for me, it, it's kind of weird. Like, like the word, like the name Ben, right? So many Bens I know, like there's that kind of adage like, you know, gentle Ben. They're all chill. They're not necessarily gentle. I don't know any like really hyper or spazzy Bens. They're all chill, right? You know Benji, right? He's chill. <laughs> right? So like, like that, that's for, for some reason, like you see like a commonality among names for some reason. It's not always true. And I, I tell this joke a lot, but for me like, you know, uh, one of the reasons why I think I was always very ambitious is because my name means uh, my name is Taeyong, right? It means big glory. Right? And so, my parents never pushed me to do anything. But I was the one who was always trying to be greater. Right? I was the one who wanted to get into like the top 15 school and all these different things. That was all on me. And so, um, you know, the story goes, like, you know, I asked my dad, like, hey, because like, I felt the pressure as a little kid. I'm like, man, big glory. Because my sisters are Juyong and Myung, so that's like... Uh, First glory and beautiful glory. So I'm like, what? Like that there's no pressure there. They can just do whatever. First and beautiful, whatever. I'm like, I'm big. And so like, how am I gonna be a big glory? And so I asked my dad, I'm like, hey, hey, like Appa was like, you know, what what's little glory? He's like, why don't you name me little glory? He's like, oh that's Soyong. That's a girl's name. And I'm like, oh, 
Oh, my bad. <laughs> and so I, you know, I went with the day, you know, I went with the big glory. But then the other thing is, in America, uh, we tend to shorten names. So I was only named Dayong for about maybe second grade. So the rest of my life, everyone has called me just Day. This is how this happened. Thank all of you. <laughs> anyway, going back to names. Names are important. And back in, in, in Exodus chapter 3, God revealed His personal name where He said, I am the great I am. I am the one who will always be. Right? He gave that name Yahweh. And He's saying, don't misuse my name. Now one thing is, by giving that personal name, all of a sudden, people can have a more intimate relationship with Him. But on the other, nobody likes it when you misuse their name, right? I'm gonna pick on Justin just for the heck of it. So, like, so you know, let's say like we started to use the expression like to pull a Justin as to mean to like do something stupid. Like, he wouldn't like that. Right? Like, oh man, I pulled another Justin. Or well, we can use his name as a verb, and I justin that up pretty bad. <laughs> and so, like, you know, if we did that, he would get angry all the time because we are misusing his name. We are misrepresenting who he is. Maybe not. <laughs> but anyway, there is a reason why God doesn't want us to misuse his name because he has given us his personal, intimate name. And to misuse it would be to dishonor, to disgrace him. And it's no, it's no, it's, it's ironic, it's not ironic actually, that the name of both God and Jesus are the most common, like, curse words that you could find in the English language, right? Now on the other side, the Israelites took this very seriously. So seriously that even today, many Jews don't say the name Yahweh. They will say either Adonai or Hashem, the name. Right? Or Adonai means Lord. And so they took it so seriously, they chose not even to say his name. But on the other side, you know, I kind of feel like you're kind of losing something because by not saying his name, you're losing that intimacy that he desires you to have. One of the things I like to do when I look at the Old Testament and I want to see how strong of a relationship a character has with God, usually I look at what name of God they proclaim. When you look in the Bible and you see them talking about God, if they use the word Elohim, which is a very generic name for God, it usually means that they don't have a strong relationship with God. But when they use the name Yahweh, that usually means they're very, very faithful. Right? It's one of those clues the Bible gives you. And so we see that in the New Testament with the name Jesus, the name that is proclaimed in Philippians to be the name of all, all names. What the New Testament writers see is that it is meant to be proclaimed, it is meant to be spoken. That's one of the differences I see in the New Testament, is that the name of Jesus is not only embraced, but is actually spoken. It's proclaimed. It's glorified. So, interestingly enough, it's really weird. Um, you know, Saturday morning prayer, where we're doing the, the book of Revelation on, at, with the main church, and it's always weird that every Saturday, um, like the, the church or the passage, it tends to kind of connect to our passage here. And so um, yesterday at 5.30 a.m., uh, our head pastor gave this message on the church of Philadelphia, which you guys should know as one of the few churches that is actually glorified in the book of Revelation. And in that, one of the things that church is... is Admonished for is that they did not deny the name of Jesus. And then at the end of the passage, what, it, what, what Jesus promises them is that, I will give you the name of God, I will give you the name of the new Jerusalem, and I will give you my new name. There are three names that Jesus promises this church because of their faithfulness to Him. So the main thing I wanted to point out from there is, there is value in the name of God. There is value in, 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 in protecting it, but there's also value in proclaiming it because it draws you into a deeper intimacy with Him. But don't misuse it. Don't justin it up. <laughs> anyway, um, the, the last, uh, the last uh, commandment here that we'll be touching upon is the Sabbath. And I've talked about this. Now, one of the things about this passage is, uh, the way it's translated is, remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. Um, it's actually better represented as, re remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. 
And what that means is remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy are actually the same thing. So we remember the Sabbath. Remember, God told His people, you work your six days, but on, your, on that seventh day, you rest like I rested. But this isn't just for the Israelites. This was also um, for their slaves, the foreigners that lived among them, even their animals. Even the animals deserved a break. And so the thing is, even though this seems to be about God's relationship with His people, it goes beyond that, where rest is something that is meant to be given to everybody. It's not like the people of God can just come together and go, okay, it's our day to rest, yay. Okay, you guys keep working. <laughs> like, work harder, guys, because we're not working today. Like, it's, it's actually meant to be rest that is enjoyed by everybody. Even the animals, right? Even Namu. <laughs> Namu, you can rest. <laughs> okay. Sorry to talk. <laughs> so, this rest is something that's meant to be embraced by everybody. Now, if you look later in uh, the book of Exodus, it also talks about the Sabbath year. That not only are you supposed to rest for one day, but you're supposed to rest for the entire year after six years of labor. Think about that. What, what if we did that, right? <laughs> Sanya says it's awesome. He's also unemployed right now. <laughs> but like, you know, think about if we actually did that right now. That we work for six years, and then we take a break for a year. And we're like, you know what? God's going to provide. It's okay. It's kind of crazy. But that's what Scripture was actually calling the, old, like the, the Israelites to do, is to embrace the Sabbath year. Not only that, the year of Jubilee every 50 years. But regardless... As I said before, resting in God requires trusting in God. It requires trusting that He will provide for you even if you aren't working every single day. Because God understood that if He didn't force us to rest, we would work ourselves to death. Maybe not everybody in this room, but most of us would. <laughs> God knew that we would tend to overwork. And He says, you know what? I will provide for you. We, we talked about this when we went over that passage on bread of heaven from manna, that God provided daily for them. God was reminding them, I am Jehovah Jireh, I am your provider. So you can rest. I want you to rest. I want you to enjoy what I have given you. Rest as I rested. So brothers and sisters, just to remind you again, Sabbath is something we need to take seriously. Now I know, especially as a, as a student, that can be difficult. Um, now I know a lot of that is time management, honestly speaking. <laughs> um, but it can be very difficult when you have deadlines and you have a lot of uh, big things coming up. It can be difficult to make that kind of time for yourself. And honestly, it doesn't necessarily have to always be a full day. But brothers and sisters, we need to habitually choose to take a Sabbath rest in the Lord. Because by doing so, we are saying, God, I trust in you. I trust that you will take care of me, that you will provide. Now, once we get to this latter part of the, the, um, the passage, it goes into what is known as the Book of the Covenant. So from the end of chapter 20 to uh, towards the end of chapter 23, that's what's called the Book of the Covenant. This is not what God spoke. These are things that Moses got from God that give more details than the Ten Commandments themselves. Uh, most of them really flesh out the things that are already in the Ten, Ten Commandments and, and give a lot of detail. We actually aren't going to be covering much of this um, as we come to a conclusion, but I just want you to know, because I'm going to be covering the very first part of it. So when we get to this part on, on idols and altars from verse 22 to 26, um, what God says is, you know what, don't make any idols of, of gold or silver. And this is kind of ironic, because in chapter, what, I think 32, is it, uh, with the golden calf, while Moses is gone for a month, this is exactly what they do. They build a little idol, this little golden cow. Right? Like, Ooh, you saved us. And so like, that's exactly what they do. That This is what God had told them not to do immediately. And he also says, no altars of earth, or, or build me altars of earth and uncut stones. Don't make anything where you dress the stones. Don't, don't cut it yourself. Don't build anything like that. Um, he's like, yeah, also don't go up there and um, show everybody the world. Um, basically, why is he so specific? The reason why is because 
This is how the people in the land of Canaan were worshipping their pagan gods. They were using idols of gold and silver. They were using very intricate altars that were built in this particular way. And they were blatantly being very sexual in, in how they presented themselves. That was part of how they worshipped their pagan gods. And what God is saying is, do not worship me like those guys do. That's why he's being so specific. So for the thing I want us to get from that is, we need to learn to worship God in the way that He desires. Okay? Now, this is kind of, we're kind of in an era where, where people are, are honestly, to my, in my opinion, sometimes getting a little bit too free with worship. Where people are like, worship is everything, it's a lifestyle. Right? You live and breathe worship, right? Yes, that's true. But God is also very particular. There are things that honor Him, and there are things that do not do not honor Him at times. Um, and one of the things that I think He's showing us in this passage is, He does not want worship of Him to be confused with worship of other things. Right? Don't worship me like those other people worship their foreign gods. I am the one true God. Worship me in a way that brings me honor. And so, to me, that raises questions because, uh, you know, not too long ago, I think it was like the mid 2000s, there was a big movement in the American church called the Emerging Church Movement, and this was like the Church in the Nightclub movement. We're like, yeah, we're gonna go to nightclubs, and it's gonna be like, no one can tell that you're from the church. It's like, it's like you're doing church in a nightclub, yeah. And like, so like, there was this movement called the Emerging Church. They were like intentionally like not saying Christian words. Um, they were sometimes using the Bible, sometimes not. Um, like that, this is when like a lot of pastors were like dressing really hipster and stuff like that, and they would like sit on a stool and be like I'm gonna give a talk. So it wasn't a sermon; it was a talk. Right? I'm gonna give a talk. Um, you know, maybe even doing like TED Talk style sermons. I don't know. Um, and there were some of these churches in the area I was in. I was in Austin, Texas at the time, that were even using purely secular songs, but saying, you know, we're gonna redeem this for God. We're singing this to God. So they were singing that, what was it, like, The Cure love song? Um, they were singing that to God. Uh, you know, I don't know if you guys know The Cure, but um, you know, they, 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 they were doing things like that. And, and like that, they were like, yeah, we're going you know, to emerge the church into today's culture. But brothers and sisters, I, I do think there is a need to maintain holiness. Right? God himself says, I am holy. I am set apart. You should not worship me in a way that can be confused with other things. Now, at the same time, I don't want to speak to the camp that's like, okay, we need to sing from the hymnal um, every single time and, uh, you know, worship like the way we've been doing for the past 50 years. Because honestly, brothers and sisters, even singing a hymn, a few hundred years ago, that was radical. You know where hymns came from? A lot of them? They were bar songs. These are drinking songs, right? They took the melody and they put Christian lyrics to them, right? So, yeah. Amazing, right? I don't know, but like, like these are like these are these are bar melodies that were put Christian lyrics to, and so a lot of people like promote these as like the most holy and most pious. But back then, it was very controversial. Right? That's not to say God doesn't use worship and doesn't use these things to honor Him, but at the same time, we do have to consider: Are we worshiping God in a way that He desires, that honors and glorifies Him? and Him alone? Or are we trying too hard to be relevant? So much so that we are actually dishonoring Him through our worship. I think that is a question that we have to ask ourselves from time to time. Just on a very side note, um, I went to, uh, so Chris Tomlin was, a, was a, a worship leader back when I was in Austin, Texas. There was a famous church called Austin Stone that, that he was uh, the praise leader once. And I went there once. And uh, they were meeting like in some like like middle school or something like that. So I went there once. I'm in, I'm toward the back of the gym because I didn't want to I don't go go too far up. But there was like a sister who decided that during worship she would do interpretive dance the entire time. So she had like a like a rope with a string or whatever. And she's like like twirling around and like doing that the entire time. And I'm like, God bless her, but this is really distracting. <laughs> Um, so for me, that kind of made me question, man, what is worship? <laughs> but anyway, side note, side note, side note. <clears throat> so, just to bring us back to what this passage is telling us. <clears throat> this is not about freedom. 
This is about God's desire to be in relationship with his people. In that same way, God desires an exclusive relationship with us. That is why he's called a jealous God. He desires the entirety of us. And he wants us to love and obey him in the similar way that he loves and blesses us. So he wants us to have that same intensity and that same love for him. Because as we love him, he actually gives us even more love. Actually, it's actually easier to love God when you first start to love him because he just keeps showering more and more on you. And this is what we'll be going on to more next week. So next week, the, the last six commandments deal more about the relationships from man to man. But the reason why we covered the first four today is because the relationship, our relationship with God is what dictates our relationship with others. So those other six commandments make more sense when you really understand the first four. So keep that in mind is that when we have a very strong relationship with God, that influences our interactions with others. So brothers and sisters, to kind of wrap it up for today, let's choose to, to love and to trust only Him, knowing that that is what He desires, not, not for our salvation, but because He desires us to be His people. He desires us to be His royal priesthood, His holy nation, His most prized possession. So let's choose to love Him. Let's choose to trust and, and to, to find rest in Him and to put Him above all things and to not allow these other distractions and other things to take his place. Let's take some time to pray. I'm going to close for today. Um, first, I want us to just take a moment to just search our hearts and ask God, God, is, are there areas in my, my life, or are there idols that are, are distracting me from you, from giving you my full attention, my full heart? Are there things that I am placing above you right now, whether it's, um, you know, career, school, um, money, uh, like a, a relationship, like, you know, people, whatever it is. Like if there are things that are, are, are distracting away from God, I just want you to ask God to reveal that to you right now. Let's pray. has already bought our, just our lives through his, through his uh, sacrifice on the cross, that this is all done. So let's just take a moment to just ask God to reveal to us his love for us, his desire for us. idols in our lives right now, that you would help us to see these things, and you would help us, Lord, to turn back to you, 
to not rely on these things, to not focus our hearts on these things, but to instead depend and trust on you. Help us to know more and more of, of your love, that, that it is a love that truly goes to the thousands of generations, Lord. But help us to make that choice, Lord, to be obedient, to be trusting in you, that we would find our rest in you, that we would find our identity in you, that we would put nothing else above you. Mold us in that way, encourage us in that way, and speak to us, Lord, we thank you.